This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Before I dive into my guest today, I have a request. This probably sounds like a broken record, but it's actually not. It's new for 2018. The first 10 people that write a review on Amazon.com. Only Amazon.com. I'm sorry. No other country or dot whatever. Just dot com. The first 10 people that write a review of my newest edition of Trend Following. That's the 2017 edition. Any other edition? I'm sorry this offer doesn't count. I appreciate you saying nice words about some other edition. I'm talking right now. Amazon.com, newest edition of Trend Following. Write a review. First 10 people that do, I will gladly send you a free copy of my audiobook for that same title. A free audiobook that works on audible.com. That's the offer. Real simple. Those are the rules. The first 10 reviews that show on Amazon. That's it. Real simple process. Now, past my little personal Michael Cavell advertisement, my guest today is Jerry Muller. He's the author of many books, including The Mind in the Market, Capitalism and Modern European Thought, Adam Smith in His Time and Ours, and his newest book, the one we're going to talk about today, The Tyranny of Metrics. Jerry poses the point. How the obsession with quantifying human performance threatens our schools, medical care, businesses, and government. An interesting direction for a quantitative guy like me. Someone who is saying very directly that we might have gone too far with the quant of everything. As Jerry says, but in our zeal to instill the evaluation process with scientific rigor, We've gone from measuring performance to fixating on measuring itself. So true, right? By no means is Jerry saying that a quant mindset is bad in of itself. But we can go too far. And I think you're going to see today in this conversation, we have gone too far already in many, many examples in our modern life. And you have to think that if we don't put a stop to some of the metric mindset, it's going to keep going and going to some very bizarre end. Let's jump right in. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jerry Muller. You know, diving into your work right now, I started to think like, you know, why did I really have a hard time in high school? Why did I not enjoy it? And we're going back, you know, 20 plus years. Why did I really not enjoy it? And I felt like everything I was doing in high school was about memorization to get to some score, some measurement. And I just kept thinking, where is the stimulation? Where is the inspiration? Give me something that makes me excited. So even going back several decades, I think we've had this measurement problem. But I mean, look at all the students that have to come to your class. Those students have to go study to learn how to take a test, the SAT or the ACTs or whatever, and learn how to take a test. And they spent all this time to do that, to get to your class to learn from you. Yes. So it sounds like your high school was somewhat deficient in developing intrinsic motivation. But you know, don't you think most are probably? I'm sure it depends just from one school to another, but from one teacher to another. Of course, there are some there are some things that students need to learn even if they're not motivated. But on the whole, it's important to try to develop a motivation by showing them why a subject is either intrinsically interesting or intrinsically important. You know, that's one of the uh, challenges, I think, of being a teacher. And it's one of the ways in which a test like the SATs, while on the one hand, they're genuinely useful in helping to predict student success in college and university. On the other hand, has the effect of becoming an end in itself in a way that distorts 
the whole educational process, which is <laughs> related to one of the themes of my book, the way in which when a particular performance measure becomes the goal in and of itself, it then distorts the incentives of the activity that you're trying to measure. That was my roundabout way of getting you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's really where it's at. And I, I just, you know, because I'm kind of like the opposite of, of what most kids today, they get motivated by. I must get this score because this will predict my life success. I was the opposite way. I was kind of like the rebel without a cause who then just went the entirely different direction. It's worked out fine for me. No complaints. I really relate to you mapping out these scenarios in your work. I look at kids today that must be on that train to where it is get the score and the learning part isn't as important really as just getting the score. You know, in my book, one of the things that I discuss in the education section is the problem of teaching to the test, which is a form of gaming, essentially. Gaming being a kind of behavior where you orient your behavior towards the thing that's the particular thing that's being measured at the price of the purpose for which it's being measured. But there's a sense in which, you know, high school students or college students can study to the test, be it the SATs or some other test, or even spend hours and hours and thousands of dollars practicing for the test in a way that distorts what the test is ultimately supposed to test, namely your general knowledge and your analytic ability. It's much better to spend more of your time reading a wide variety of things, including ones that aren't assigned for your high school class, reading a good quality newspaper every day, and so on to develop your mind intellectually. And some of that will be reflected on the test. But meanwhile, you'll have reached a genuinely significant goal, namely becoming an educated person. Well, you know, what we're really going down the path of here is going to talk about metrics and the, the growing use of metrics, the growing quantification of society. And I must share with you that one of the reasons we're talking is because in the last 10, 15 years, I've written several books about quantitative trading and quantitative trading to turn a profit. And you know, it works exceptionally well. It works exceptionally well in the narrow niche of saying, hey, I will use this limited data set to make buy and sell decisions and profit over a long period of time. It works fantastic. However, getting beyond my little narrow world here, if we expand that out to where we are trying to put a quant view on everything, it kind of leaves us as an author, and you're going to probably start to know this already, is Amazon. I mean, Amazon is all about gaming the system, people pushing rankings, pushing metrics, reviews that could be real, reviews that could be fake. There's so much gaming, right? And so what I'm leading to is I want you to describe this great example because it's a really scary example, is the gaming of the medical profession via metrics because the doctors, my father's a doctor, doctors are so concerned about how they're measured, how they're judged in a quantified way, it's leading to a lot of unintended consequences, isn't it? Doctors are legitimately concerned with what I call metric fix fixation. By metric fixation, I mean a combination of three things. One is the notion that you're going to replace judgment based upon experience with standardized quantitative measures that don't require experience or don't require judgment. So that's the first thing is these, these standardized performance measures. And then linked to that is the second element, the idea of reward and punishment, that you're going to attach rewards and punishments to those standardized measures of performance. And those rewards can be, rewards or punishments can be monetary, but they can also be reputational in the form of rankings and ratings. And of course, rankings and ratings can have effects in the real world. And that's connected then to the third idea, and that is that you are going to publicize these standardized performance metrics in the name of what's often called accountability. So one of the early ways in which this was tried in the medical system was that some states in the United States, like New York State, began to gather standardized performance data and publicize it on the record of 
surgeons performing certain standard operations, hip replacements or knee replacements or standardized kinds of heart surgery. When they started to do this, so they would gather the data and then they would put it on a website that indicated the relative degree of success or failure of each surgeon on that kind of procedure. What then started to happen is that surgeons started to engage in what we call creaming or cherry picking. That is to say, they simply refused to operate on patients where the risk of failure was greater because the patients had comorbidities or some other problem. So on the one hand, it improved their scores or kept their scores good, depending on what the case may be. What, what the people looking at the scores from the outside wouldn't see was the patients who were never operated on because they were considered too risky because they might die. And then, of course, they often did die without the surgery. That's one of many kinds of gaming behavior that one finds in the medical field, or to take a case from the National Health Service in Great Britain that's become kind of famous for people who study these sorts of things. There's a lot of this uh, metric madness or metric fixation in Britain, by the way, in both the educational system and the healthcare system. So the NHS, the National Health Service, was concerned because patients were concerned about the amount of time that they had to wait in the emergency room before they were admitted. And the NHS told hospitals that they would be monetarily penalized if patients had to wait in the waiting room for more than four hours. Well, that sounds eminently reasonable and metrics seems like a magic bullet, but here's what sometimes happened. When patients were being brought in by ambulance, the administrators in the emergency wards would tell the ambulance to keep uh, circling around with the patients in them until the patients could be admitted and seen within four hours. So the people that suffered there were the other patients who were sitting at home waiting for an ambulance to come, but the ambulances weren't available, but the administrators in the emergency wards hit their metric goals. So that's another example, rather radical example of this. Well, these medical examples are frightening. Yes, yes, they are. And then what's interesting is the way in which this the system is the system of metrics is sometimes set up in a way that encourages or even requires this kind of gaming behavior. I mean, there are scores and scores of them because um, hospitals and doctors are remunerated on the basis of standardized codes for each condition. There's tremendous incentives for what they call upcoding. That is classifying the patient as having a somewhat more serious condition than he or she actually has. And in fact, I've been told that when medical residents are being trained, one of the things that they're told is the importance of upcoding or certainly not downcoding because the hospital wants to be rewarded on the highest possible basis. So measure, I, I'm not against all measurement. A measurement is necessary and often useful, but there are these predictable kinds of unintended negative consequences that often come with performance metrics. You know, I've done this podcast for many years, 600 plus episodes. I've talked to many of your peers in the academic community, and this is one of those aha moments where I'm sure my audience is going to be just like I am right now, which is just like jaw open, tongue hanging out, like you've got to be kidding me. I mean, <laughs> it's frightening. I keep saying frightening, but it's true. I want to be clear, Michael, that measurement can really be useful. It depends on who's using it and how. So for example, in the medical field, if you gather this comparative information on how various surgeons or how various surgical units are doing in terms of their success rate on various procedures, and then you make that information available to the actors themselves, that is the doctors and nurses themselves, so that they, they can compare how they've done to how their peers are doing, and you remove the element of reward and punishment, and you remove the element of making this information public. So the people who see it are the actual practitioners. They can then use that to analyze and diagnose what they're doing right and wrong. And in that sense, measurement can be really useful, but people often confuse the use of measurement for diagnosis by practitioners themselves with 
the use of measurement for external accountability and for external reward and punishment. As an end user, though, if I have to deal with the medical community in the not too distant future for some particular reason, as an end user trying to go by these metrics, is it fair to say that it's just really impossible to know? Yes. You need a lot of experience and judgment to know which metrics that you see on some hospital website are actually relevant and what the extenuating circumstances are. In other words, the idea of metric fixation is to provide easily assimilated numbers for audiences. But in fact, it takes a lot of sophistication to understand the significance of the numbers, whether they're distorted, in what direction, and so on. You know, if you see a hospital that has uh, four stars instead of five, it could be that that's because it is located in an area with a difficult patient population. That is, people who aren't in, aren't in good health for a variety of reasons. Unless you know that, you don't really know that four stars might be better than some hospital located in some suburban location where every they get five stars, but they get five stars in part because their patient population is very healthy. Let me shift you back to something really quick because it just kind of struck me, which is we were talking about the scores, the SATs, the ACTs. If I ask this question to most people, I'm sure we get a pretty standard answer. But you seem like a pretty interesting guy, so I'm going to ask the question, and I want you to really give me your honest, heartfelt, deep down perspective on this this particular question. What is smart to you? How do you measure smart? What's your measurement of smart? How do you go about that? Some of it is general in terms of uh, IQ, that is your general ability to take in information, uh, spot patterns, apply knowledge that you've gotten from one place to extrapolate it to another place. So there's that kind of generalized intelligence, uh, IQ. And of course, that has subdivisions of its own, visual, verbal, and spatial, and the numerical. You know, all of those kinds of qualities are important. But then there's other kinds of intelligence that have to do often with experience in a particular field and knowing how to make use of or apply knowledge that you've acquired and uh, actually make it work in the field. That kind of knowledge, as I say, often comes from experience. Hard to quantify that kind of knowledge. It is hard to quantify that kind of knowledge. Yes, that's right. (laughs) That's one of the general points of the book, too. A lot of the most important things in life and a lot of the most important things in organizations are unquantifiable. So the fact that something is quantifiable does not make it important. And the fact that something is important doesn't make it necessarily easily measurable. There's so many topic areas that I want to go into with you, but I'm in my 40s, late 40s. I've got some kind of like techie friends in their 20s and 30s. The guys that are in the tech space almost can't think like the way that you're giving the alternative view and the tyranny of metrics. They almost can't go that way because they have been so structured into metrics And they've got them rewarded by this, though. Honestly, a lot of guys have made a bloody fortune by just going by these metrics. But to me, every time I have these conversations, it's like talking to robots. Yes. Well, of course, that's what they aspire to be is human algorithms. I've written some books about this kind of thing. You just correctly said a few minutes ago, you said there are some great ways we have used quantifying in in our lives and business and in life and everything. But it can go too far. One of the effects of quantification, which is so widely on the one hand, so widely taught in business schools and also is so widely applied in trading firms who you know, sometimes hire people with PhDs in physics and engineering for their math ability. One of the effects of that emphasis on quantification is that it has a negative effect on entrepreneurship and innovation because it's the nature of innovation that you're trying something new. You're trying some new product or some new method, some new system of distribution. And it's the nature of trying something new that you don't know whether it's going to work. So you can't calculate it in advance. So insofar as investors and investing institutions or or, even venture capitalists, insofar as they focus on 
the quantitative. What can you show me is going to be the market for this product in five years? They're going to turn down those products where the answer is, we're not sure because this is a new kind of product and we can't actually calculate how great the market for it will be. So in that sense, there's a, there's a sense in which this emphasis on quantification is anti-innovative and anti-entrepreneurial. It, it tends to lead to going with more of the same in some larger degree. It's anti-creative. Yes. I mean, that's one of the things that worries me in terms of its larger economic effects. But of course, that kind of creativity and entrepreneurialism also exists within all kinds of organizations that are not profit-making organizations. Government organizations, uh, government departments, and so on, they require also some people who are creative and innovative, and in that sense are entrepreneurial within that realm. But if those people, if everybody is told that you have to meet these standardized performance targets and you're going to be rewarded and punishment ac punished accordingly, then it leaves less room for innovation and it leaves less room for risk taking. As you probably agree, a lot of the creative things in life require a good deal of risk taking. So to take one example that I cite in the book, the person in the U.S. counterterrorism community who was in charge of those analysts who worked on trying to find bin Laden for a number of years, you know, year after year, they were working on it and didn't find him. The, their superior said, all right, I'll, I'll take the risk. I'll let these analysts continue to work on this project because my experience, my judgment indicates that they might very well find him. But the risk is that they could have worked for years and not had any performance metrics to show for it. And then, of course, finally, they did find him and there was a big payoff. But that's often the case in life, that big payoffs require risk and risk involves the unquantifiable. I was just thinking about an example of the creativity meeting the quant and how it's going down. For example, Hollywood. It used to be that the Francis Ford Coppola, the Oliver Stone, Steven Spielberg, they would take chances and do these crazily different movies. Today, all we have is Superman 63 and Spider-Man 24. Right. So there is a close link, of course, between quantification and the formulaic. And what you're describing in Hollywood is the fact that studios have become formulaic. That is, they have standardized formulas of how long a script is supposed to be, where in that script action is supposed to occur, and how often, and so on. And in their defense, one of the results is because they take less risks, because everything is so formulaic, they have fewer turkeys, fewer really great failures. On the other hand, they have fewer great films, because great films are almost by definition non-formulaic. It's all just superhero films. If you're into superhero films, it's a great time to be alive. Well, I think it applies to romance stories and so on as well, this propensity to use uh, formulas and only accept scripts that conform to those formulas. Let me shift you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into government in a second, because I want to tie some of these things together. There's another great example, which as big an aha moment for me as reading on the, the medical side of what you're uh, exposing, the, the measurement the tyranny of metrics, which is law enforcement. I mean, look, medical law enforcement, they're, they're both situations where we could have a loss of life unnaturally. But why don't you map out kind of big picture? It goes off in a lot of different angles what's going on in law enforcement. And it starts with the crime statistics, doesn't it? Yes. One of the attractions of metric fixation is that it appears to be, is that if you have some problem in your city or in your school system or whatever, it appears to be a silver bullet. It appears like a surefire solution. Let's say there's a problem of crime, which there indeed often is in cities. And the problem is sufficient that it becomes a political issue. Then the elected Mayor will tell the police chief, unless I can show that I've reduced the crime rate by 5%, I'm going to be challenged in the next election. So you, the police chief, have to lower the crime rate by 5%. So the police chief then takes that to uh, the people below him, 
the people who uh, you know are the commanders of precincts and say we have to lower crime by five percent, and they in turn take it to the cops on the beat and say you have to lower crime by five percent. But what they can do is lower the reporting of crime by five percent. Crimes can be reported to them by citizens and they can simply not record it. Or what happens more often is that they take crimes that ought to be major crimes and and they get reported in the FBI statistics like uh, larceny and they report it as a misdemeanor, as a minor theft or something like that. So you can you can reduce the crime rate by reducing the seriousness of the crimes that are reported without actually reducing crime. Or to take another example, when cops are evaluated or the police system is evaluated according to the number of arrests and prosecutions, it creates incentives to arrest a lot of low-level people and not high-level criminals who it might take many years to develop a case against. But if you arrest that top criminal, that only counts as one in the metric, whereas if you erase some fellow selling dope on the street, that also counts as one, and that's a lot easier. So the incentives then are to engage in a lot of low-level arrests and not engage in the kind of concerted, long-term police work that would lead to arresting the top people in the, in the crime family or syndicate. How did you start to put this kind of information together with law enforcement? Because I, I've got some experience with local government law enforcement, and usually getting information that they don't want to give, they'll, they'll hide it under some exclusion, or they'll make it difficult with FOIA laws, or perhaps even these big decisions that you're talking about are never even, they're supposed to be written down, they're supposed to be uh, you know established in minutes and, and records, but some of these decisions at local government can just be kind of like something off to the side where the mayor and the the chief just kind of say, hey, here's what we got to do. How did you start to piece this together, though? The most useful way of starting to understand it is by insider accounts, that is by people who have been there and done that. And one of the places in which this was originally called to my attention in the realm of policing is through the uh, HBO drama The Wire, which was written by two people, one of whom had been a cop in Baltimore, the other of whom had been a had been a reporter. They drew upon their own experience in portraying what I call metric fixation in a wide variety of realms, including in policing. A lot of the progr- a lot of the series focuses on the drug trade, and there the the detectives are told uh, deliberately we have to clear more cases and if we and if you emphasize trying to catch the uh, top drug lord in town that's going to take a lot of your time but if you if we arrest the people who are actually selling drugs on the street we can have a much better rate of arrests uh, and similarly uh, the series also deals in policing in the realm of uh, in the realm of murder where the issue becomes then the clearance rate so how many murders are there and how many do you actually solve and there's a an incident in the series where uh, they come across some really dastardly drug suppliers who are murdering substantial numbers of people in a neighborhood and burying them in abandoned houses and they're told well let's not go into these houses because if if we find the bodies we're not going to be able to solve the case it's going to lower our clearance rate so let's not do it in the realm of policing it was first called to my attention by this dramatic series which as i say is based on insider knowledge and then i then i read some of the scholarship on policing and articles on policing, including testimony by various policemen and ex-policemen who testified to the fact that this kind of gaming of the metrics goes on in cities across the United States, but also in Great Britain and in many other countries. It's quite a ubiquitous phenomenon. Yeah, I would, I would think on the, the local level with uh, the local politicians, the local law enforcement, it's not, you know, they're probably not exactly happy that Jerry's coming along and saying, uh, hey, uh, guys, look behind the curtain here, how the uh, sausage is made on the local level. I'm sure some people are not happy about that. Right. Some people aren't. But on the other hand, you know, one of the things that 
this misuse of performance metrics does is it makes the actual practitioners very dissatisfied, unhappy, and demotivated. You talked about teachers feeling that way too, big time. I've talked about teachers, but I've got since publishing the book, uh, I've gotten letters from former police officials saying, uh, you know, Jerry, if any, thank you for writing this, but if anything, you've understated it in the case of policing. And I get letters uh, every week also, not, not letters anymore, but emails from physicians, especially retired physicians or recently retired physicians telling me how much this kind of metric fixation has distorted the practice of medicine. Uh, the truth is that, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that there are a lot of people working in organizations, in, in public corporations that are profit-oriented, uh, in government, in education, in medicine, who have a tremendous degree of frustration because this kind of metric fixation stands in the way of them doing what they think is actually important, namely the purpose of the organization, like healing the sick or reducing crime and increasing public safety and so on. And one of the purposes of the book really was to help these people articulate in systematic form what's wrong with the organizational culture in which they've had to operate. And to be clear, this is not meant to be that you are uh, you know, a Luddite from when it comes to quantifying things. You're simply saying, perhaps we've gone way too far. We need to reel it back and use a combination of judgment, experience, and the quantitative data. Exactly, exactly. Because the truth is you need experience in order to figure out which things are worth measuring in order to figure out which things you can't measure. And then once you have the data in order to figure out, in order to understand how relatively important the things are that you've measured compared to the things that you can't measure. So in all those ways, standardized measurement can be really useful when it's combined with experience and when it's combined with judgment. What I'm concerned about is the many cases or the greater, the ever greater propensity in our culture to try to eliminate the role of experience and judgment in favor of these standardized performance metrics. Let me run into kind of a tangential type direction also in your work. Today, we've got these CEOs that seemingly can go from industry to industry. They don't even need to know anything about media or engineering or whatever. As long as they're an expert at the metrics, they can just be plopped in, plopped in, boom, boom, boom. That's really, that's a fairly interesting direction that metrics have gone down to. Because it used to be, for example, if you were in the car industry, you were probably a lifer. You came along, you knew every last detail of it. And many of our, many of the car uh, companies in America, guys started it, guys and ladies that started at the very bottom, worked their way up. And that's been pretty typical across the world in companies. But that is kind of changed now. We're kind of got these rock star metric guys that kind of jump between disciplines pretty regularly, huh? Yes, I would say that's one of the deeper pathologies behind all this, is this kind of ideology of managerialism. That is, in order to manage a company or a government agency or a university, you don't really need depth of experience that would develop your judgment over time. What you need is a mastery of certain managerial tools, and those tools are content neutral. That is to say, they're quantitative. If you're the head of one company that makes one sort of thing and you go to be the head of a different company that does something uh, in an entirely different area, the notion is you can do it because you can take the same managerial tools, the same performance metrics, the same reward and punishment for performance, and you can apply it. The result of that, of this kind of managerial ideology, is several fold. Uh, one is, you know, you look at you, uh, the, the new person comes in, he's used to a certain system from his previous company or that he learned in business school. He sees that that system isn't in place in the new company. So what's the first thing he does? He calls in the consultants and the consultants are there to help him find new ways of uh, accumulating data and analyzing it. 
I mean, there are some consultants who are, of course, expert in particular areas, but there are other consultants whose real expertise is in these kind of standardized metric tools. And then the second effect of it is uh, if he, if he, if this manager comes in from or CEO comes in from from some other company, he wants to demonstrate how clever and talented he is so that when the headhunter calls, he'll have metrics to show. So what's he going to do? He's going to try to improve the quarterly profit. And what's the fastest way of improving the quarterly profit is by cost cutting. So you cut back on uh, staff, you cut back on capital expenditure and so on. All of uh, what's the hardest thing to understand when you come to a new company or a new industry or a new university? R&D, research and development, because there you got to really understand what's actually being made and produced. So the propensity is to increase profits short term by cutting back on R&D, cutting back on staff and so on in a way that's often demoralizing for people in the organization, even though it makes some investors who are oriented towards the very short, the very short term happy. But it's bad for the long term productivity of the company, of the university and hence of the economy as a whole. It's really difficult to argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a little bit of a, a momentary sidebar, um, unrelated to the book, but kind of connected to the book. It's a, it's, a, it's a line that you had in your materials that I caught somewhere, and I would love for you to explain this. As a special bonus to my book, The Tyranny of Metrics, I have not provided any PowerPoint slides, believing them to be a distraction from complex ideas. Now, as a as a guy, as a guy who's taken the stage quite a bit, and and, and I'm the audience is all they all want the damn PowerPoint presentations, right? You know, and I and I, and they often want these things in advance from me. And I tell people, I say, listen, I'm not giving you my slides in advance. You're not going to get them in advance to give people to print out to stare at them while I talk. It's not happening. Not doing it. Uh, you seem to be a uh, a cousin of my belief here, but I like the way you explain it. Why don't you give your rationale? <laughs> okay, so that was only half tongue in cheek. Oh, I know you believe this. Yes, well, I do believe it. A, a major business guru had just published a new book, and he tweeted about the fact that you could get this, you could get the uh, PowerPoint slides for it uh, as an accompaniment to the book. So I I tweeted back. Not tweeted back, but I tweeted it as a as an additional bonus to my book. Uh, there weren't any PowerPoint slides because they they detract from understanding. I have no doubt that there are occasions where PowerPoint slides are useful if used in a scrupulous way, primarily to demonstrate uh, or to show some sort of quantitative. Uh, analysis, uh, you know, a, a graph or a chart or something like that. By and large, I think uh, the overuse of PowerPoint decreases the actual intake of understanding in lectures. And one of the reasons that it does that is because uh, the lecturers who focus on the PowerPoint don't learn the basic techniques of lecturing, namely to speak in such a way that people are interested in what you're saying. Basically, the speakers just read their slides. Right, right. They, they're just, that's right. They're reading their slides and there's really nothing more boring in the world than that. And you didn't really have to come to the talk to hear them read their slides. I mean, there are some things that are conveyed perfectly well uh, without hearing a speaker. But the point of being a speaker is that you have to be able to arouse and hold the interest of your audience uh, in the way in which you lay out your argument, in the way in which you use your voice, in the way in which you circle back to certain key points to underline it in their minds. So I think that uh, expertise as a broad generalization, probably expertise in PowerPoint use and expertise in public speaking are inversely correlated. I generally, for, for a PowerPoint, because most people just, at most events want this kind of stuff, I, I generally will do something maybe 20 or so, usually just an image. And so I, I'll put the image up and, you know, no notes or anything, and then I'll go with the image and use that as kind of like some flavor, some sauce to go with what I'm saying, but there's no words that they can sit there and read and go, okay, I'm listening to Mike and I'm reading Mike and I'm listening to Mike and I'm reading Mike. That's crazy. Yes, right. That's right. In in that sense, using images 
cartoons or other kinds of images can, can be can be genuinely useful in holding the audience's attention. Yeah, we both agree that that's not typically the way in which PowerPoint slides are used. No, typically PowerPoint slides are used by some functionary at some corporation, somebody who has zero public speaking skills, perhaps they've done well in the company, whatever. They put a nice suit on, they stand at the podium, they look down, they read it, and everybody in the audience acts like at the end of 30 minutes it was a good presentation, even though most people wanted to kill themselves. Right, right. And the other thing that happens, of course, is that is that the PowerPoint slide tail starts to wag the lecture dog. So I've seen speakers who are very knowledgeable and intelligent and capable of speaking well, who lose all sense of uh, spontaneity and so on because they feel committed to getting through all their slides. So we talk about all the metrics, right? And so let's go to, actually, you know what? I'll make it two smaller ones. First, let's, we've been kind of talking USA. You mentioned Great Britain. But this is this this notion of metrics it goes well beyond the states, for example. China. I mean, as far as I understand with China, China is all about the metric. They want to have basically a number on your forehead to judge you ongoing the duration of your life. Right, right. So, you know, my book has been out for about two months now, and among the languages that it's uh, that it's going to that's in the, it's in the process of being translated into is uh, simplified Chinese for the mainland market and traditional Chinese for the Taiwan market and I think that that happened in part because these metrics are so ubiquitous in Chinese life they put uh, the Chinese government I mean the mainland government put a, a lot of emphasis on developing metrics for their universities to try to get them top ranked within uh, within world rankings. And they created a metrics, uh, metric evaluation system that was just based upon uh, science and engineering because to, to judge a whole university because that's what they're really interested in. And promotions there are heavily based upon, uh, you know, the number of articles that you publish and so on. And one of the effects that that has had is that it leads to a tremendous amount of gaming, both in the sense of uh, faking results in order to get published articles, and also a phenomenon that you find elsewhere in the in the world of science too, as these as these uh, metric evaluations have become more and more important. People take research and they cut it up into as many articles as possible in order to increase the number of articles, but the expense at the expense of the significance of the articles and their efficiency in conveying what the research has actually been. Yeah, yeah, metrics are by no means just a matter of uh, Great Britain and the United States. I'm not sure why, but I see that my book seems to be selling very well in Australia, and I get the impression that uh, metrics, this kind, of, this kind of metric fixation has become ubiquitous there too. And then, as you say, the Chinese government wants to try to measure everything and give people these credit scores based on algorithms. There's obviously something problematic about that, but I, I have... Coming to America soon, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't researched it in sufficient depth to, you know, have a novel opinion about it yet. We've now got this, as you point out, this, this, this overload on metrics. But, you know, look, it is the hand we've been dealt... And so if we take it to the public policy realm, we take it to the government realm, and we can look at just every aspect of public policy. And we've talked about some of the things today from, from, uh, from school to, to medical. And just imagine what happens when you get into the bowels of Congress in, the, in Washington, D.C., when all of these folks are using metrics. Either side is using a metric to try and make, to make their case, to make their point. But you end up, it seems like if you kind of just blur your eyes and take a step back, you end up with this kind of soup of nothing. And so all this big picture creativity, you know, for, for example, hey, here's something about China that do really well. They're building high-speed rail. Hey, where's the high-speed rail in America? Okay. You know, why can't we just build the high-speed rail? Because we've probably got every metric in the world that tells us that the best that we can do is the Excella from DC to New York. So we can't build high-speed rail. Who knows what the reasons are? But I think there is, from a public policy standpoint, I'd love for you to comment on this, a public policy standpoint, you have creativity on one side, you have risk-taking on the other, and then you have all these metrics on the other side. And all those metrics on the other side 
I think they definitely help to stagnate a society. Well, I'll tell you what I see as the greatest lure in a negative sense of this metric fixation. And that is, look, every society and certainly American society has lots of problems. I mean, in some places, the crime rate really is too high. The K-12 to education system doesn't educate people as well as we would like. The level of spending on health care is high as a, as a percentage of GNP in a way that's, uh, that invades people's budgets and the profitability of businesses and so on. So there are lots of real problems in any society and certainly in American society. What worries me most uh, in many ways about metric fixation is that it seems to be a silver bullet. It seems to be a solution to every problem. But often it, and, and sometimes, again, if the metrics are used in a diagnostic way, they can be genuinely helpful. But if they're used together with publicity, with accountability and pay for performance, they can often be counterproductive in ways that I have started to uh, describe in our discussion here and in many more ways as well. So what worries me is the fact that, uh, this will, that this is so often seen as the solution for every problem. And then if you say, as I do, you know, often it exacerbates the problem or it creates new problems. Then people will say, but you don't have a better solution, so we have to use this one. But the truth is that the fact that there's a problem doesn't necessarily mean that there's a solution or it doesn't mean that there's a solution that's not going to either make the problem worse or create new problems of its own. And that's something that's pretty hard for people in a liberal democratic society to accept. And it's, of course, not something that politicians can say. They can't say, yeah, I recognize there's a problem, but I've analyzed this. I've read the best literature on it. And it's pretty clear to me uh, that there's actually no solution to it. Well, if I was to think in trading terms, I could think about variability, volatility, randomness. These are all natural things. And perhaps what you're really describing is the societal effort the public policy effort to try and optimize every last thing to some peak on the plane that doesn't even exist. It's imaginary. We're never going to get there, but we go down these steps pretending we're going to get there when, frankly, most people that are making these decisions know we're never going to get there, but we still go through the process anyways. And there's always people who want to sell you their secret formula, just uh, hire their consulting firm or just buy their book. And that's going to be the that's going to be the formula that's going to solve all your problems. So there, there's always there's always people selling solutions. There's not that many people like me analyzing the problems with the solutions. Cool stuff, Jerry. Appreciate it. The tyranny of metrics is available everywhere. Jerry, is there a website we can send people to? Princeton University Press has a website, and you can then search for the tyranny of metrics, or you can go to my, uh, I'm represented by, uh, for speaking purposes, by the Lee Bureau, L-E-I-G-H. You can go to, they have a very nice uh, website with information about me and about the book and a video of talks that I've given about it and so on. Jerry, again, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I, I still own a house in Vienna, Virginia, even though I'm calling you from Asia. So I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of close to you and kind of not close to you. <laughs> well, it's been good to talk to you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.